Greetings PLO order, time for another video and this time we're going to talk about macro management and what is macro management and how to use it, what's the right way to do it, what's the wrong way to do it, you will see in a bit. So bankroll, poker bankroll is the amount of money you have for poker and for probably most that sounds pretty simple but for some players it's not that clear what is poker bankroll they say that I have a net wealth of 50,000 euros so my poker bankroll is 50,000 euros but that's not true if you can only use 100 euros for poker so it's the amount of money you have that you can invest in poker if you choose to it's not the amount of money that you have on given site. It's not the amount of money you have distributed on all sites. If you have money on your bank account, you have money on stocks, whatever. You have money under your mattress. If it's usable for poker, it's in your poker bankroll. So it can be distributed in multiple places. And sometimes people think that, okay, if I have... 500 euros on on certain site then I have to use that 500 bankroll for that site and then I have thousand on another side on there I can play bigger games it might be true it might not be true just remember that today when we talk about poker bankroll it's it's the whole bankroll you have it doesn't matter if you distribute it on five sites ten sites so everything is on one side or, or one third is on the site and two thirds is on your bank account. We have two different bankroll bank types. I could say that it's dynamic bankroll and static. And th this is very important because it, it dictates our bankroll management in later. Dynamic means that your bankroll is flexible. You can put more money if needed. So let's say normal person plays a few nights a week, has a day job, then his bankroll is dynamic. If he goes broke, he can deposit from the next salary the next two hundred dollars or two hundred euros or whatever. Then <clears throat> static bankroll means that you cannot put more money. Let's say you are unemployed, you don't have any income in life. So if you go broke with your book bankroll, you can't put more money. And then we have very dynamic bankrolls, we have very static and somewhere in between. Most often it's like if we have dynamic here, fully dynamic bankroll and fully static, then most players are somewhere in between. Like Okay, you have a bankroll of 2,000 euros, you can deposit more, but you don't really want to. Or, or it hurts your outside of poker life if you have to deposit more, so you don't want to do that, and so on. Or you can deposit more, but it takes a month to get that money. So it's between dynamic, between static, but it's important that you understand what your bankroll is, how dynamic it is, how static it is. So now we set and clarified what bankroll is. Now BRM is for bankroll management. And bankroll management is just a set of rules that you should follow. And, and the rules are not quotas because you set the rules, you can change it. You can decide if you follow it or not. So it, it's not like someone said on top of the mountain that these are the rules that you have to follow. No. But it's macro management is, uh, is, is the rule how to use your money. And the sole purpose of macro management is to prevent you from going broke. Pretty much that's the ultimate purpose. If you have infinite amount of money, then you don't need bankroll. It doesn't matter. Your net wealth is all always infinite. So 
that's the thing. Or if you don't mind going broke, you are recreational. Every Friday you deposit 100, have a few beers, play whatever poker variants you feel. You don't mind losing that. It's more like having fun, a little bit of gambling. Then you don't need bankroll management. Just deposit play. When you go broke, do it again. And it's fine. The, the important thing, thing is that it's fine if you enjoy it. There's no right way to play poker. There's no wrong way. It's just if your actions support your goals, then it's fine. And the thing is, if you're a losing player, then there's no bankroll management that can save you money, except the one where you don't play. Then that's plus EV decision. But if, if you're a losing player, then bankroll management is, is just a way to make your money last longer. But it doesn't make a losing player a winning one. And, and bankroll management, it only works if you follow the rules. The thing is that you can set all kinds of rules for yourself, but if you don't follow them, it doesn't work. It's like on, on many other things, if you try to lose weight and then you set the rules for yourself, how often you exercise, what you eat and so on, if you don't follow those, it's not going to work. It's that easy. So just making the back row management rules doesn't mean it works. You have to follow them. So that's important thing. And, and the reason why we have back row management is variance. Because variance both sucks and variance is a great thing. And poker is a game of luck influenced by skill. Chess is a game of skill without any luck. Some other games are games of skill influenced by luck. But poker is, is a game of luck. If we play 100 hands, it's very 50-50 who wins. Unless there's a huge skill edge that favors one of the players. But it's influenced by skill and the more we play, the more the skill influences. If we play infinite amount of hands, then we can remove luck. But as long as we have limited amount of hands, whether it's even one million hands, luck involves, or luck is involved in the results. And in a bit you will see why. Uh, PLO Omaha has higher variance than some, than some other games, like limit hold'em. Not much variance compared to Hold'em. PLO has more variance than, than Hold'em. And, and the thing is that the equity is run closer. Pot gets bigger closer. Uh, pot gets bigger often. So there's more variance, more all-ins. And standard deviation is the metric to define variance, to monitor variance. And in, in poker, and for the variance calculations, we say it in terms of PP per 100. And for PLO, it's around 170 PP per 100. And you can see that on your tracker, if you have poker tracker or holding manager, there's a stat called standard deviation, STD, dev, or it's a standard deviation, PP per 100. And, and if you can get that PP per 100 stat, you can see, of course, the bigger your sample size is, the more accurate it is. And I, I checked some games from this year, and it was between 150 and 200. It depends how aggressive you are, how passive the average opponent is. So it's not like every PLO game has a STD dev of 170. If you play on passive, games it's less if you play very aggressive games it's higher if you're aggressive player it's higher if you're passive it goes down and so on but we could say that in modern six max good average number is 170 more or less and you will see how how it affects those swings and we can simulate swings and variants with variance calculator. And I have here primedog.com 
for covariance calculator. What we do here is there's a wind rate in big lines, and then there's observed wind rate. You, we don't need that. And there's the standard deviation, B1 per 100. And there's some examples, PLO 6 max, 120 to 160. But yeah, well, if, if you're passive wear, that's true. If you're a bit aggressive in modern PLO, where the aggressiveness has gone up from the days that these numbers were fetched, then 170. But you can see your number and put it here. And then the number of hands, and then when we calculate, we get this messy graph. And I will show you what it is. And, and let's say we are 5 pp per 100 winner. We are not crushing the stakes. We are not the end boss. But we make decent, decent amount. And our standard deviation is 170. And let's pay for 50,000 hands. And when we calculate, we get this kind of graph. And what this means is the straight line here is our expected win rate. And you don't have to worry about this green line here. But all these graphs are the winning graphs of a player. And there's 20 samples. So there's 20 players, each one of those, each one of these colored graphs is exactly the same player, exactly as good player playing versus the same opponents. And this is what kind of variance there could be. Out of the 20 player, one player in the end is making 144 buy-ins. The ex expected win rate is, is around 50,000 hands. 5 pp per 100, it's around 25 buy-ins. But someone is winning 144 buy-ins. Running hard, yeah? Well, the same player could also be running minus 100 buy-ins. And, and this is the absurd fact about variance. You can be a winning player and you play 50,000 hands. A lot of people think that's a lot. You can lose 100 buy-ins due to variance. So, yeah. But then most players are here, but, but we can see that there's a lot of players losing money in 50,000 hands. Now, if we fight variance with volume and we play 100,000 hands, we, which means that you have to grind. If you want to play 100,000 hands a month, that's on average over 3,000 hands a day. And, and if you play only on, weekend, uh, only on weekdays or weekends, that, that requires a lot of hands. And the poor bastard, the dark red line, out of 100,000 hands, he's losing 150 binds. So it, it would suck to be this guy. On the other hand, the light blue guy who's running hard is winning 233 binds. And he thinks poker is easy. Let's go pro. I quit my day job. I'm going to play PLO then as a pro because I make 2.3 thousand euros a month on PLO then. And then the next month, variance hits and he goes down 150 points. All right. If we lower the standard deviation a little, if you think I'm just being over dramatic, we drop to 150. Well, the poor bastard is still losing 110 binds, and the lucky pro is winning 200 binds. So, yeah. Sucks to be the dark red guy. If we increase our win rate, and, and I would say 10 BB is on small stakes what winning player at least should get, because we include, of course, rate back on promotions. So you need to win around four to five BP per hundred and then get another five BP from rate map and the total amount is 10 BP. Now we can see that this, this changes a lot. Now even the dark red guy who was the poor bastard, 100,000 hands, he's losing only 60 bytes. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like, oh, 
that's not that, not that bad anymore. But if if you lose sixty buy-ins a month when you are a winning player, it hurts. The live blue guy, two hundred sixty buy-ins, boom. But we can see that the break-even point is here, and except for the dark red guy, all nineteen players are making some kind of profit. So as soon as your win rate goes up a little, it means that we are not losing money. The, the chance of losing with big sample size is very minimal. And if we beat the games, 10 BP per 100, and then we had 5 BP from rate back, then we can see that even the dark red guy starts to be more like break even. So the <laughs> unlucky person he is, he is not losing his whole bankroll, but most of the players are making some kind of profit. But let's stick to the 10 BB and 100,000 hands. And here is also a nice sample of downswings. And, and I'm going to explain what this does, but let's say we play that 100,000 hands, 0 0.1 million hands win rate of 10 BP per 100, the same parameters as before. And and these red ones are what kind of downswings there will be. And the blue one is the profit. So we this graph would look like, oh, this is awesome. The graph is awesome, going up steadily. But then during this graph, all the red ones are downswings. And, and this is the in, interesting part. In 100,000 hands, with 10 BP per 100 win rate, we can see the chance of getting certain downswings. And I would say that 30 buy in here, 3,000 BP. Then something is happening outside. Wow. 30 buying downswing is, I would consider it a major one. And it will happen 30% of times if you play 100,000 hands. And and 50 buying downswing, the chance is 11%. And we will get 10 buying downswing over 60% of times. So it's pretty unavoidable. And if we change to 5 BP per 100 winner, then the numbers go a bit absurd. 30 buying downswing will happen 60% of times. So it's more likely that during 100,000 hands you will have 30 buying downswing than you wouldn't have. And then, then the stretch is to have a 30,000 hand downswing more likely than not. So we can see that the more marginal winner you are, the higher the variance will hit you. And the bigger your win rate is, the less variance hits you. Now with 10 BB, chance of getting 30,000 hands downswing is only 30%. Chance of getting 30 buying downswing is 30%. So in, in a way, we fight variance with volume. And we fight variance with win rate. And, and one of the best ways to re reduce variance is to increase your win rate. And now we come to the question, should we always aim for higher stakes to the rate? Because that's something that often people at higher stakes say that you should try to get to PLO 200 as fast as possible because the rate is smaller. And, and let's say your win rate, of course it drops, but let's say you, you make 10 BB on PLO 50, and then you would make 2 BB on PLO 200. And in the end, the expected income is the same. The expected profit would be the same in the end. But 10 BB on PLO 50 has variance, 2 BB on PL 200, super high variance. Like if we put here 2 BB per 100, I I'm afraid to even press this button. Yeah, you could be this guy. 100,000 hands, 2 BB, 
chance to clear 30 bind downswing is 83%. I mean, Jesus Christ, 100 BB, 100 bind downswing over 50%. So the variance goes through the roof. Of course, you could be the, the light blue one who makes 180 binds if you run hard. But you just increase the risk a lot to make the same income if you don't improve your win rate on PL200. So that's one aspect that people often forget when they just say that you have to get up as soon as possible because the rate is high. Um, we could do a video about game selection, but I, I would say that don't rush to higher stakes because of the rate, because there's more aspects. The level of opponent gets higher or, or gets better when you get up higher on stakes. So if you're a winner on PLO 50, it doesn't mean you're a winner on PLO 200. If you crush PLO 5, it doesn't mean you're a winner on PLO 25. So it's always harder to make money. Of course, on higher stakes, one BB is more, but pretty much always when there's the discussion about that, people forget the variance part. When your win rate goes down, these numbers go up. How likely it is to get a big downswing. And even if you are this 10 BB, let's say you're crushing stakes with 15 BB win rate and then get 5 BB from rate back. Even then, to have a 10 bind downswing, the chance is almost 50-50. 30 bind downswing, 13% in, in 100 thousand hands and let's say you play half a million hands then the numbers wow it goes actually down how it is possible weird variance in variance calculations but here we can see that there is a downswing of, in, in this variance simulation of 500,000 hands, there's one downswing of 50 binds. So you, you just can't avoid them. It can happen even to the crushers. And, and if you're crushing the stakes with 15 BB per 100 win rate, and then you hit pretty much straight down 50 buying, a couple of nightmare sessions, nightmare month, then it hurts your confidence that it's unavoidable, so to speak. When you play enough, you will see the downswing. And I often say that if you think that PLO has given you the worst downswing it can, don't worry, it will give you a worse one. I, I, I'm always, there's, there's so many situations where I thought that now I have seen the worst downswing you can do or you can, you can have. And then I will have a worse one. So I, I, I learned that. <laughs> Never underestimate the variance. But yeah, that's that's how variance in, in influences our macro management. And you can put your number, simulate swings, variance. Uh, as a rule of thumb, then bind down swings are unavoidable. 30 bind down swings are still everyday bread and butter. Everyone has those. And then some unlucky ones have 50 to 100 bind down swings. Even if you're a winning player, there's variance. <laughs> right? Then, about macro management, we have two options. We can have aggressive macro management or we can have passive one. And there's no right or wrong macro management. No one can say that your macro management is too passive or your macro management is too aggressive. There's no set rules. There's no right. There's no wrong. Macro management is always a tool, so it has to suit your needs. And before you know the needs for your macro management, you can make a macro management. Sometimes people make the mistake that they set their macro management without thinking, what am I trying to achieve with my macro management? It's just a cool thing to have. They post in the forums, hey, I have this new background management. But they don't think why they have it. And, and to simplify things, aggressive background management means 
that the required buy-ins to head up in sales is, is over. So we use aggressive background management to go up in sales. The objective is to get to the next step. When we win there, to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. And then the, the biggest question is how keen are you to drop down? If you start from PLO then, how much it hurts your ego, your confidence, if you drop to PLO 5 or to PLO 2, or you start from PLO 100, how keen are you to go down as much as required? <laughs> and there's no right or wrong. You have to know yourself. So think, if dropping down is something you don't want to do, for whatever reason, then you have to set the background management so you don't have to drop down or, or the chance of dropping down is, is a bit lower. Make it suit your needs. And, and passive background management is more about to stay at given state. Let's say you're happy on PLO 50 and then you just want to grind. Then the background management is way different than if you would like to go to PLO 100. And the thing is that if you have aggressive background management, you should have a dynamic background management because then the more aggressive we are, the higher the chance is that we go broke in the end. Background management never prevents you from going broke. It makes it less likely. And when we have aggressive background management, the chance of going broke goes up. So you should have a dynamic background management that you can deposit more if needed. Aggressive background management and static bankroll, that's a bad combination. And here's an example of aggressive background management. Uh, it's something that I call dirty buying background management. I have used this very often. And the idea is to get up in states. We have a bankroll, I'd say uh, $300 we deposit. And we know that, okay, we can win on PL25, we can pay, win on PL50, but if we use 30, 100 bankroll and go to PLO 50, that's six buying. So there's super high chance that we go broke at some point. It's up to variance. We can lose it in first 15 minutes if we run bad. So to prevent that, we need macro management. And the idea is that 30 buying is always the ground zero. And anything that is over 30 buying for the current stakes is used to take shots for the next stakes. And then when we drop down to 30 buying for the lower stakes, that's when we go there and we start to use the 30 buying rule on that stakes too. <laughs> so here's an example. We deposit 300, that's 30 buying for PL on then. And we start to grind PL then happily. If we win, then any money that is over 300 will be used to take shots for PL25. So let's say after the session we have $350 on our bankroll. Then that $50, which is what's over 300, that $50 is used to take a shot to PL25. So we could open up two tables of PL25 and start to grind it. And as soon as the bankroll goes, under 300, we close the day, we we'll go back to below 100. And sometimes you have to repeat this. Grind 50, take a shot, get back to below then. Grind 50, take a shot, get back to below then. But at some point, grind 50, take a shot, win 100, win 200, win 300. It might be the first shot. It might be that you run bad a few times. It's the seventh shot or 15th shot that works. But at some point, if you're a winning player on PL25, you will start to make profit. If you happen to lose on PL then, once you have 150, which is 30 buying from the next one, you go back to or down to PL5. And then anything over 150 is used to take a shot on PL then. And on the other end, any money over 750, which is 30 binds for PLO 25, anything over 750 is used to PLO 50, and so on and so on. 
So depending on the variance, you might go up and down like an elevator. But the amount of binds you need to lose the rope row is 63, assuming there's PLO2 available. So if you follow the bank roll, you start 300 with PLO, then you have 30 binds, but then when you lose 15 binds, you go to PLO5, and there you have to lose 18 binds to go to PLO2 if there's PLO2 available. And on PLO2, you have to lose 30 binds to go broke. But if you have a downswing of 63 binds, it means your bankroll is zero. And it's not impossible. We just saw on variance calculator that binds over or, or downswings over 50 binds happen. The thing is that on if you're a winning player on PLO then, then your edge on PLO5, PLO2 is quite high and the games are quite passive. So to have that kind of downswing is a bit unlikely. But it could happen, you could tilt, whatever. So that's why you need to have dynamic, because the 300 might put down. Or one option, if you have dynamic bankroll, is never to go down on PLO5 if you don't like. You pay PL then on the Euro Pro. If that happens, you deposit more. Shit happens. Let's do it again. So, this is one example. You can increase this to 40 binds, 25 binds. 20 bind PLO, then 40 bind on PLO, 25, 50 bind on PLO, 50. And all of those are as good as the other ones. There's no right or wrong. So, Backroom management is a risk management tool. That's it. It's nothing that fancier or medical. It's just a risk management. And the more you have risks, the more you should be prepared. And, and that, that means if you have mental game problems, you know that sometimes you start to play bad when you're tired, when you're annoyed, when upset. Sometimes you play drunk then your bankroll management should be prepared for those. So don't be too aggressive if you have a lot of risks. Or if you're happy to take the chances, you don't mind the higher risk because you have very dynamic bankroll, then go for it. It's not wrong. As long as you know what you're doing and accept it. I mean, I mean the worst thing would be that now someone takes my 30 by bankroll management, follows it, goes broke, and then blames me. Because your bankroll management sucks. I, I went broke even when I followed your bankroll management. That would be stupid. Because uh, the bankroll management, one thing is it doesn't work if you don't follow it. That's the simple thing. And, and bankroll management is not a law. You can change it if needed. I often see on forums that people post that, okay, I'm going to start my background challenge. I have a 100 bind rule. I will grind 100 binds on, on PLO then before I move up. And then they start to grind. And they grind. And they grind. And they grind. And they make 100 binds on certain stakes that might take a lot of time unless you're a crusher. And then probably they say that, oh, this is stupid. I quit. I start a new project. The thing is that you can always change your background management. You can even throw the background management out of the window. This background management sucks. I will make a new one. It's always a tool. It's like if you go and buy a hammer and then you start to do what, whatever you do with hammers, then you see that, okay, this hammer doesn't work. I need a different one. What do you do? You go out and get a new hammer. You don't say that, okay, I, I bought this one hammer. I have to use this for the rest of my life. And now the hammer broke. The handle came off. I still have to use it because you can have only one hammer. No, you just get a new one. You change it. You use it in a different way. Whatever works. It's same with macro management. It's your macro management. You can do whatever you want with it. So if you see that something doesn't work, change it. And 
If you feel I kind of want to follow my stupid bankroll management, then don't. It's yours. It's your money. You can do whatever you want. But just understand what it is, how it should be used, and so on. So there's a few minutes, actually went over half an hour, a few minutes about bankroll management. If you haven't tried the variant simulator, then you probably should because variance is a big part of PLO. And you can just Google it, variance simulator poker, and it should take you to Prime Dope's variance simulator. And, and just play with it, you will see what kind of swings to accept, uh, expect. So when the swing does happen, whether it's up or down, you don't be fooled by variance. Often people think that when we win 100 buy-ins in short run, it's because we're so good. We're so damn good that we win 100 buy-ins. And then when we lose 100 buy-ins, we are the unluckiest person in the world. Well, you're not. On those simulators, there's only 20 players. And if we put there a million players, which we can't, but if we could, like there's a million players that play online poker over the world. And then the unluckiest of those one million, you can imagine how unlucky it is. Because the sad thing is that you can be a really good player, crusher, and you run bad for your whole lifetime. So it, it it's almost inevitable that somewhere in the world is a really good player who never won in poker. And there's also a really bad player who doesn't have any idea of good strategy and he's crossing the games because of variant. Million hands upswing. It can happen. So, variance is good for poker. It means that bad players keep on playing. So, don't say variance is bad. Without variance, there wouldn't be bad players. And without bad players, you can't make profits in EV. So enjoy the variance. Macro management is a tool to reduce the damage that variance might give you. So hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you got some ideas about macro management and about variance. I will see you on the next video. Thanks and bye bye.